Okay, I guess it might as well get started. Other people might join us as the evening goes on. I thought once again, I wanted to start with prayer. So if you'll bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity to come together and to talk. Guide us in our lessons and help us to see opportunities where we can bring reconciliation. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 And I'm going to start with a couple of the verses I'm using are actually in the, she used in the chapter, but I thought I'd start out with Matthew 4, 17, because she's talking about in the chapter uh, 10 there about repentance. So Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach his message, turn away from your sins because the kingdom of heaven is near. So Christ is telling us to repent. And the word repent actually just means when you're coming from the, uh, I guess the Hebrew, to change your mind. Change your mind and start doing things a different, a different way. And then the other one that she did use that I thought I would read, it's Matthew 5, 23, through 24. So, if you are about to offer your gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go at once and make peace with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift to God. So, um, of course, the Jews offer, you know, brought offerings to the temple to make, and so we don't quite do that the same. But, um, and the other thing she pointed out about this that I really hadn't thought about before, it's not saying about that you have something against someone else and you need to reconcile. It's if someone else has something against you. Whether you believe it's uh, valid or not, you need to try to reconcile and, and work things out. And the last one that she talked about being salt and light, this is for those who are in CWF, we uh, talked about that. And that's uh, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are like salt for the whole human race, but if salt loses its saltiness, there is no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. Now, salt is used to preserve things and to make things taste better, to season things. And so salt improves. Actually, salt is necessary for life. Uh, people in deserts as well, they take salt tablets because they, you need, you need salt. Um, Americans, of course, eat probably too much salt, but anyway, that's, but, so. So salt is to make things better. And that's what we are to be like salt. We're to make things better. And you are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, it is put on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. So our light is supposed to shine. We're supposed to do good deeds and uh, give credit to God. So these are things Jesus talked about in the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount. Chapter 10. I wanted to start with the very first quote there on page 109 uh, from Desmond Tutu. The past, far from disappearing or lying down and being quiet, has an embarrassing and persistent way of returning and haunting us, unless it has in fact been dealt with adequately. And so she goes on to say that a lot of whites don't really understand the things that racism and the past has caused and it's still causing troubles. And so people say, you know, get over it. You know, the Civil War, good grief, that was a long time ago. And Jim Crow, that's been illegal for since the 50s, 60s. So that's, uh, what, 60 years? You know, there's been no Jim Crow laws. Um, 
had the Civil Rights Act, 1964. So that's been around for a long time. So why, you know, why is the big deal? Just get over it, you know. Well, as we've seen, a lot of people who say that, and this is something I would have said, quite frankly, before I was reading all this, um, is racism isn't just in the past. It would be different if it were in the past. And everything, everyone had equal opportunity now and the laws were all um, done fairly for everyone. Everyone was treated, treated alike, treated with kindness and that. But that's not the way things are. So racism is still going on. It finds its roots way back 200 years ago, or actually longer, because like I said, uh, slavery has been around since I think almost the beginning of mankind. Um, <clears throat> Because if you think about it, think about Abraham. He and Sarah had a slave. So slavery is all the way back. It's all, you know, all through the Bible. It's just something the way things were. And I, no one really seemed to think anything about it. I guess unless you were a slave, then you probably weren't too, uh, too thrilled. Um, another thing people say also is like, it's not our problem, you know, it's a problem in the black community and blacks should be working on it. You know, I'm, I'm white, I, what can I possibly do? I can't help. And so the authors are also saying that's not true either. Everyone can help. Everyone can do things to bring people together, to make friendships uh, with someone who's not exactly like you. Let's see, though, I think the one question. Yeah, on 118, question number one. Has anyone ever told you to get over something? How did that feel to you? Was it just was it a justified request or did, did it feel unfair? Was it helpful? Did it serve as a motivation to work through whatever the issue was? Felt really dismissive. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. no, it didn't help anything. <laughs> no, I don't think it does. Um, I do think people do have some personal responsibility somewhat. If people have apologized and tried to change things and you still can't let it go, you need to try to let it go. You know, if they've asked for forgiveness and you said you've forgiven them, you can't hold on to you know, hold on to everything. You need to be able to let some situations go so you can move forward. But that doesn't really apply here because racism is still a problem in uh, housing and the criminal justice system and all sorts of other ways. So how do you think Matthew 5, 23 through 24, where you're supposed to leave your gift at the altar, go reconcile and then come back, how does that work in today's world? Well, I think the opposite of what you just said is also true. If, if I have wronged someone else and I apologize to that person um, as many ways possible, you know, face to face, over the phone, through a written note, whatever, and they choose not to forgive me, I have to move on too. So it, it's, it works both ways. So I think leave your gift at the altar and try to reconcile. I mean, I think... I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I think many Christian people do that. But when that doesn't work, you just have to move on. And I would come back and offer my gift and go on into the temple if I were, if that happened to me. If you try to reconcile and you can't make it work, what else do you do? I don't know. I guess well, Jesus, the people look around. Yeah. I don't remember what the circumstance was, but I guess when Jesus was evangelizing, he told the disciples, I think in Acts, you know, if you go into a town, I'm breaking you up into groups two by two. And if you go into a town and you do your thing and they don't hear you, shake the dust off your sandals and move on. So there are a couple of folks in my adult life that have chosen not to forgive me when I wronged them and I have no contact with them and I just moved on. I guess they did the same. Mm hmm. I think also part of what that verse is saying is how important relationships are to God. 
Hmm. It's true they won't always work out and they definitely may not go the way you want them to go, but relationships are really important, not only between you and God, but you and other Christians and just other people. There's several places that said that you should act so that everyone would give you praise, you know, even if they're not Christians, that they will notice how you live. And uh, would we all agree that all relationships are not equally valuable or necessary or i'm not sure what the right adjective is but i mean i would work a whole lot harder to reconcile with you guys and my cwf friends and family members and church people in general than i would and i guess people i work with other than i mean i, I don't regard all relationships as equally valuable some i'm willing to let go and not mm -hmm. work as hard at I also think that the, the relationship, the closer you are to that person, the harder you would have to work because there's more there, there's more of a bond there versus someone who's perhaps maybe an acquaintance. And then it's not maybe as difficult because they can't wrong you as much because they're not close enough to you. Mm -hmm. usually, and when it's a family member, they've usually wronged you and you've wronged them. So there's some give and take there but if it's an acquaintance and you wronged them and they don't forgive you i mean the chances are they haven't wronged you it is a one-way thing so there, there may be sometimes people feel that you have wronged them when really you haven't done anything too it's just their perception and well, that that's another good point jamie I, I mean there have been people that have told me i have a cousin um that went um canoeing but she's very independent on Lake Powell by herself kayaking. And I said, wow, that's really brave um, that you would do that by yourself. I mean, she lives out in the West. She's mm -hmm. a doctor, retired, single, not married. And, and she, don't patronize me. I said, excuse me? <laughs> I'm expressing concern for your safety. An accident could happen. You could slip and fall and hit your head on a rock. She thought I was saying as a woman, she shouldn't be out there by herself. Mm. So I. I gave it right back to her and we're still cousins and we still get together once every three months until COVID. But she thought I was patronizing her. I said, Linda, don't take offense where I didn't intend any. I'm expressing but see, you two, you you. two worked it out. She spoke oh, yeah. up well, and said that that offended her. Oh, she was highly and, offended. And you were saying I didn't, you know, so anyway, it right. worked out. And that's kind of how I think we have to uh, approach uh, different situations. Yeah, perception is 85% of reality. You know, how... Well, and some people, don't you think, Kathy, some people just thrive on that, too? They're constantly offended at somebody. It just gives them a purpose to wake up. Yeah. Well, you know, coming back to the, the racial issues, I don't know if any of you saw it. There was um, the show, The Talk, that comes on in the afternoons, Sharon Osborne and some other people. And there was a big, um, they had a big, pretty heated discussion the other day. And, and it, as I watched it, it seemed like it, some of it, some of the issues seemed to be how the different people perceived it, perceived something um, as, and so, you know, whether or not that show is even going to continue now is apparently up in the air because it, it was such a, it was a pretty heated discussion. Well, I think there was an agreement ahead of time among the ladies not to put anybody on the spot by asking them a broadside question that hadn't been talked over prior to the show. And I think Sharon felt like um, that's what had been done to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She'd been broadsided by the um, African-American lady and I can't remember her name. Mm -hmm. Well, I think she also wondered if the producers had set it up too. Yeah, Cheryl. Cheryl, uh, Sharon felt like Cheryl had broadsided her. And she yeah. said, we don't do that on this show. We talk it out ahead of time. Yeah. She was but it, but it, I think it played out some of how racial issues work these days. You know, um, sometimes, you know, how things get perceived based on your own filters 
in your own life experiences and how you perceive different things. Mm -hmm. I what, think sometimes that's what makes it hard for someone who grew up in, a, you know, basically all white community necessarily to see some of the stuff in the African-American community because it's just, it's not how we perceive things. And uh, I think sometimes we just don't see it. Mm -hmm. Jamie, I grew up in Brunswick County, Virginia, which is predominantly black, but I have no exposure hardly to black people. I went to a white, all white academy school. I went to an all white church. Um, I worked with black people on the farm, but there were no black people of my equal mm. in the community. So. so I grew up in a predominantly black county in Virginia, um, but have no interaction with other than the lady who babysat us or ironed for us or worked in the fields or that sort of thing. Well, it's amazing how we have managed to segregate ourselves in situations. Like you say, there's more, more Blacks in the county, except you were segregated. Maybe Very not, much of your, so. not of your own doing, but someone made sure you stayed in all white schools, went to a white church and did all these, all these things. And it's still that way out there today. So the main town is Lawrenceville and the black folks live at one end and the white folks live at the other end, which I think is common in a lot of towns. Yes, usually there's a a black section. Part of that's because of uh, rules and regulations that they kind of got stuck in there. And I think some just choice that you want a place where you feel comfortable. You don't want to always maybe live in a neighborhood where you're always going to have to be attacked or you're always going to have to explain yourself or you, you get the feeling you're really not wanted. You just can't get, you know what I mean. Uh, I think some yeah, of that. Who wants your, who want your windows broken out and your kids beat up, you know? So, um, the next uh, story, which I'm so everyone's familiar with, is uh, the Good Samaritan, and she's talking about who is our brother, who are we supposed to take care of, and she's talking. They're talking to whites now that uh, blacks are our brothers. They're our brothers in Christ, and in the uh, I think everyone's familiar with the uh, story. Uh, and what they pointed out is the Samaritan wasn't to blame for what happened to the, the man he helped. There have been two religious people who just walked out right on past. Uh, he wasn't there when it happened. It wasn't his fault. He didn't cause it. But he saw someone who needed help. And it didn't matter whether they were Jewish or some, some other um, tribe or race, what do you want to call it? back then he knew they needed help and so he helped and that's what that's the example we're supposed to have everyone so, everyone's our neighbor so who would be a modern day samaritan who would we look at as being a samaritan in our society today you know samaritans were looked down upon by the jews well if you take the United States and a lot of places, blacks would be the the ones who were looked down upon, or uh, Hispanics were often looked down upon. So it would make it all the more uh, remarkable if they went out of their way to help someone who was white, someone who wasn't of their, you know, their own race. Well, how about biracial children? Um, sometimes neither culture will claim them. How about Amerasian kids after the Vietnam War? That was um, a shame. The, that was the shame whites, what happened on that. White soldiers had children with Vietnamese women, and the Vietnamese society absolutely did not accept them, and they almost all were adopted by American people or immigrated over here. Um, the Amerasian, there were thousands of them. This is to point out, not to make ourselves feel any better, but racism happens everywhere. Well, sure. It may not be black and white, but it's some group against some group. So it's uh, a very, very common problem. Um, 
I think things are, I think the fact that there are so many multiracial couples, you think back 20 years, how many multiracial couples did you ever see? There were almost none and there were definitely none on TV or in, anything else. And now they're, uh, it's a lot more common. You know, you see, uh, I think the latest thing on all ads has to have a mixed race couple anymore. All ads have to have mixed race couple, um, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that, but I just think it's kind of funny how we go in one, you know, one way uh, when obviously the whole, you know, mixed race still is the minority. But I think as people get used to associating with people of different races, things will improve. And I think that's part of the point of their book making friends with people who aren't like you uh, helps things improve. But another problem, I think sometimes with the uh, multiracial, which I always thought was interesting, um, Barack Obama was considered the first black president, but he was half white. But whites don't claim them. And I don't know why it seems like the blacks have been much more receptive to accepting biracial mm -hmm. children and uh, biracial uh, parents than, than we have. Mm -hmm. And um, so. Uh, Would we agree that there are places in the country you still wouldn't go if you were biracial or you were dating someone of another race? Lots of places it would not be safe to go. There are no biracial couples that I'm aware of that where I'm from. When I go home, I see nothing of what I see here in the city. Back well, I'm home. Sure, I'm sure there are because there's deep pockets of racism, places where, mm -hmm. you know, people people aren't safe. And my guess is the those people, they're aware of where they can go and where they can't go. I think you do see a lot more of them on college campuses. I think you see more of them in big cities or even medium-sized cities more so than in rural. I think part of that is in a bigger city and you have um, more opportunity to meet someone of a different race than you do if you're from a really small town where there just isn't that many, you know, people to meet. So, so anyway, we're all neighbors and they're all our brothers in Christ and they're all created in the image of God. So C suggests when, uh, what white people need to do uh, is a lament, repent, and prevent. You notice it rhymes, it makes it easier to remember. Um, what were your thoughts on that? It really starts on page uh, 114 is where they're really talking about. They talk about lament first, that's the first thing that we need to lament what has happened to blacks in our society. We need to lament that they were once slaves because that was, that was wrong, even as the people back then didn't think it was. We know now it is, you know, we wouldn't want, we wouldn't want to return to that. Or any time that they're mistreated, <clears throat> that we need to listen to them and lament with them that they're not being treated the same as we are. Like I said, my goal is for everyone to have white privilege and then it'll be, you know, even if you're not white, you get, you get to have white privilege. So <clears throat> it makes for a very nice life, I'll just tell you that. So, uh, <clears throat> so you need to limit and to limit, even if you aren't to blame because um, I've never owned a slave. I've never sold anyone to slavery. Uh, uh, and that sort of stuff. So obviously slavery was not my fault. I don't think I even probably have any uh, ancestors who owned slaves. I'd be very surprised if I did because half of them are from up north and, and the other half are too poor to own a slave. So I don't think, so it's not my fault, but you can still lament these things that have happened in the past and apologize and be sorry that they happen. And I think the bigger thing to be sorry about is that we really still haven't gotten completely past it. We haven't really made uh, 
the amendments, you know, making them citizens and equal to everybody really the way things are, because they're not, they're not in, not enforced and be. And then the next one is repent. And like I said, she said the word repent is to change your mind. So let's change your mind about how things are run, about how things are done. Um, a lot of times if you, well, I just say myself, you're unaware of what a lot of these situations are and that they're still existing. Um, so kind of repent that I was ignorant, you know, that I didn't try, I didn't look and see. And to change our ways and look at things, how can things be done differently to bring everyone one together. And then she goes on to say that if you're going to think differently and repent, then you need to follow that by acting on it. Because James, you know, faith without works is dead. So if you have faith, the work should follow. You should want to be able to make changes to make things better for everybody than they are right now. And then her last one there was um, prevent. And that's basically acting, trying to find ways to change things, to make things, make things better for all of our citizens, for all of our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, some of the problems that we need to correct are gonna be very hard too correct, very intractable because because of how long it's gone on and the way things are are segregated and how do you go about making effective change? And I don't have the answer to that. I I really have no idea. Well, she gave a long list of things. She said um, how we pray, how we vote, who we oh, spend yeah. time with, how we spend our money, how we speak, and how we live. And I was trying to think for each one of those things, how would I do that involving a black or an Asian person or, or whatever, Native American? And the only thing I could think of was how we vote. I wanted so badly to vote for Colin Powell for president. And at the time he wouldn't run because his kids were still too young. And he said, if I get assassinated, I have a family to worry about. And I thought it was really sad that he had to worry about that. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I never did get to vote for him, but I thought, what a wonderful man. Um, Condoleezza Rice, I absolutely adored. Thought she was just a wonderful, educated person. Um, and, and many others whose names just escape me right now. But there have been so many wonderful role models and great people. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure how I would do all of these. How we vote, someone would have to run that we could vote for. Um, who we spend time with, um, I, I'm, I'll be honest, I, I'm not going to go seek out someone to make a friend. I'm friendly to everyone. I would never be rude or disrespectful like in a grocery store or uh, any kind of, you know, interaction with someone because of their race. And I, I don't think anybody I know would either. Mm -hmm. um, so with the things that the authors listed, how we spend our money, how we speak, I mean, all of us give lots of money to charities and to help other people, how we speak. I mean, not disparagingly, don't use the N word. I mean, none of us would do that stuff. So how we live, I'm just not sure without somebody fleshing it out, how I would do what I do now differently. Well, I think when you're giving your money to help those who are poor or uh, that. We all do that. That you are. Yeah. You're trying to help them make a difference. I think she's also just saying to be open, to look for those opportunities where you can do these things. Because she even says you really shouldn't go up to someone's door and knock on and say, you know, I need a black yeah. friend. Will you please be my black friend? Right. You know, that's... <laughs> uh, I don't think that would go over well, for one thing. But anyway, but to be open to when the opportunity arises to be able to do these things, to think about it and look at ways that we can change, like the criminal justice system. There are so many changes that could be made. And I think people are trying to start do that. It's just gonna be a while before it ever is uh, 
completely effective, I guess you, you want to say. Um, so um, the other thing she talked about was sin of apathy. And that is one of my best sins. Uh, I can be extremely apathetic, mainly because I'm lazy. So uh, laziness and apathy really go well together and uh, does prevent you from doing stuff. So I'm confessing to all of you I'm just that I have that. the sin of apathy and no, the sin no, of laziness. No. No, what? No. I'm just going to put it out there. Anyone who teaches all the different things you do in CWF and a little class like this is not someone who is lazy. Just putting it out there. No. <laughs> well, I force myself to do things and get out and do things. If I w were not doing it, I basically would not do nothing. I would, do, I could easily, easily do absolutely nothing and be perfectly happy and content. Uh, <clears throat> now, Bernie, on the other hand, would be miserable if he did not have things to do. You know, he needs to be around people. He needs something to do. He just can't sit around and do nothing. He like, it's not in his nature, right. which is when people people say, have we been quarantining? I said, well, uh, <clears throat> to an extent, yes, but uh, <laughs> Bernie still has people over in the garage and they don't stand, he doesn't measure to make sure they're six feet apart and they don't wear masks. Uh, he goes and visits a neighbor. And stuff so anyway, um, yes, I could easily do absolutely nothing. And I go through long spells where I, I really do do nothing. I think that's part of uh, depression runs in my family. And I think that's uh, kind of how depression uh, manifests itself in me, not wanting, just having no energy, not wanting to do anything, you know, too much work. But I don't have something on my to-do list. I make one up. I called Kendra the other day and said, are they coming to mulch the memorial garden? She said, yeah. I said, oh, good. I'll go pick up limbs. <laughs> I'm creating a list of things to do. Weeds. I got to pull weeds and vines and limbs. And I mean, I just make stuff up. Oh, I have a long list, long, long list of things. I, <laughs> I do too. Of things that need to be done. And I will say, since I started on the antidepressants, I am getting stuff done. So I think... Um, I've been on them for a while now. Bernie, I can't, I can tell the difference in that I do stuff. Bernie says he can tell a difference in my mood and things like that. But, uh, cause when I was talking yeah. to the doctor, I said, you know, I don't know if I'm depressed or not. I said, I can sit on the couch for four or five days watching TV or reading. And I am perfectly content and happy. And, but I know in my mind, <laughs> I shouldn't be content and happy. I should be doing something and and that and so um it happened a lot of tries. i said i don't know if it's just because i'm tired because it, it it really is bad after a trip when i get back from something like that so the one question she asked me she said well do you ever feel in despair and i said oh no i never <laughs> feel in despair i'm perfectly happy things are going well i'm doing exactly what i want to do so no there's no despair there but she put me on antidepressants anyway so so there well, once we come out of covid jamie and you can go to cwf and hiking club and you can st we can start going on trips again you'll be so busy you won't have time to turn around that is true i would gotten myself once like i said bernie told me to go get some friends yeah i have uh <laughs> my social calendar is much much fuller so yeah because i do a lot of the same things you do and now things are starting i mean in the last two weeks michael and i have planned and booked three trips and we're like rolling it's like i can't wait for this mess to end that will be good okay moving on any other comments on chapter 10 before we move on to 11. well were you going to discuss guilt and democracy um the, the guilt piece I, I had to say I don't feel guilty for growing up the way I grew up. She talks on page, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's chapter 11, my bad. Okay, but say I don't remember that here, but that- Yeah, I, I didn't see my line where I ended my chapter 10 notes, my bad. Okay. So uh, in chapter 11, 
I thought of Matthew, or there, I think she brought it up, Matthew uh, 7, 1 through 5. Do not judge others so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way you judge others, and he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? How dare you say to your brother, please let me take that speck out of your eye when you have a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So part of what she's talking about, and I've heard this so many times, they're talking about, you know, they talk about problems in the black, you know, with racism and that, but someone in there really brings up, it's true, some blacks are killed by police, but blacks kill are much more likely to die at the hands of another black with a gang or something like that. I mean, that's just statistically the way, the way it is. Or the proud that um, how the nuclear family has broken up a lot of times in not just the black, but I think any uh, lower socioeconomic groups, how often there is not a, you know, a man in the house. Uh, part of that's unintended consequences. In the uh, war on poverty, if they had an able-bodied man in the house, they couldn't get the help. He was supposed to go get a job, even if jobs weren't available. So, and then people just get that way. So she's saying that there are problems in the black community. She's not saying there aren't, and they will need to be dealt with, but that's not what they're talking about here. Just because there's those problems doesn't mean we can't tackle other problems, that these other problems don't need to be looked at and taken care of. And these are some of the things like ending racism and that is something that we are kind of able to do. We're never going to, I don't think, be able to go into a black community and stop the gangs. You know, that's just not something that's going to be what we're able to do. So you need to look at your own failing. So what, Kitten, did you want to talk about? Oh, just the fact, the, the guilt, um, you know, the quote at the beginning of the chapter, um, the Kafka quote, uh -huh. my daddy principle is this, guilt is never to be doubted. If you feel guilty, then you probably are at fault for some degree. Um, I, I just wondered if there are people who feel guilt and shouldn't. Usually when I feel guilty, I know I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if part of this is... Um, being sure that we're aware of some of the socio social and economic pressures over a long period of time um, and being aware and sensitive that have had impact on minority communities mm -hmm. you know and and our our trying to be sensitive and aware from our perspective of white privilege to those long-standing issues that impact the black community and other communities of other minority communities too. I think, you know, I don't have a problem if you feel guilt over not having done enough, not having tried to make things better. But I'm like, and I don't, or I don't feel guilty for all, all and how I grew up and how I lived. Uh, yeah, me either. That I don't feel any guilt over that. Right. Uh, but if you're gonna talk about guilt, I also have done nothing to try to help people. I give money, I mean, to church for various programs that we have, but for the most part, I've done nothing to make lives better in other communities, in the black community, Hispanic community, uh, you know, and that part of it is, I don't have a lot of contact, but you know, if you really wanna go out and get some, do something, I could have gone out and joined groups. I could have done stuff if I had really been interested at the time. So, so um, I find a little guilt on that. I, I think also um, it, it's 
a lot of times it is, you know, from a, from a financial standpoint, when communities, and they can be black, they can be white, they can be Hispanic, when they don't have the ability for the, the young people to go out and get jobs, um, they will find a way to make money. And very often drugs are a fast, easy way um, to, you know, it, it, it's something that decimates a community, um, not definitely based on color because of the fact that, you know, certain people are forced into these communities just because they're denied opportunities elsewhere. Um, but uh, again, it's if the jobs aren't there, the drugs are. Mm -hmm. so. No, I think that on the black on black crime that people bring up, you know, and like I mean, they need to clean up their own their own act. But a lot of that, it is personal choice. Obviously, you don't have to be in a gang. I mean, uh, but uh, but a lot of but, the face causes of it is things that happened in the past. The lack of job opportunities. Yeah the lack of educational opportunities and things like that that have left them with very few choices. And, uh, and a lot of that can be attributed back to past government policies, uh, current government policies probably on some things. Uh, Jim Crow, I do, racism. I really, really like it when successful Black people that have lifted themselves out of poverty, either through sports or music or education, go back to their communities and say, use this track to get yourself out just like I did. I can't tell you how many different books I've read. I just read one about three doctors in um, Newark, New Jersey. They grew up as kids together. Um, it's called We Beat the Streets, and it's about three little black boys. And has anybody read that? Have you read that, um, Gina? We Beat the Streets, about the three black boys that grew up in um, Newark, New Jersey. Um, and, and they had issues with the law, and they had some run-ins with drug dealers who wanted them to be couriers and all that. But all three of them are now doctors. And it's, it's a middle school bo uh, book for middle school boys. I think is sort of what it was written mm -hmm. for because it's it was on the YA rack. I love YA books, but I mean they really struggled to beat the streets. I mean just because of where they lived and the educational opportunities. But when teachers saw their ability, they got them in a fast track and got them to a select high school program. Um, I, I just wish. I, um, I can't tell you the thousands of times, and Kathy, you probably have too, I have told kids, not just black kids, use education as your tool out of poverty. And some can do it and some can't. Because sometimes it's really hard. Mm -hmm. I know, I know, I did it, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. know I had advantages too. I do think, like you were saying, the, uh, the blacks who have found success going back into their own community, I think is really fabulous because I think minority kids are going to listen to them far more than they would listen to a white woman coming in and telling them, you know, you, you, you have choices, you can do this, you know, but when they actually see someone who has done it, who is like them and understands where they're coming from, I think it, it is very, very powerful. And uh, I really do and so many of them now, they have foundations and things that they've set up to be able to do these sort of things in the communities where they came from. And I think that's, I think that's fantastic. And, and if they're poor, they can go to college for free. All three of these boys pretty much went to college for free and all three of them went back to Newark. They're all working back in their community in New Jersey. They might've moved on now. I mean, the book was written 10, 12 years mm -hmm. ago, so, but. but a part of the thing they talk about that when you bring up problems in the black community, a lot of times that is to shift the blame to get out of it um, so that you don't have to do anything. They obviously need to solve their own problems. Um, well, don't we think they should help? Oh, yes. And I don't think yeah. in the book they're saying that they shouldn't help. I'm yeah, just I think they saying should that they, they need help because so many things are institutionalized against right. them. And that is hard for them to make the changes without people from all walks of life uh, helping to bring and, that. And especially for people who have been in prison, it's hard enough to get a job if you haven't been in prison. 
If you have been in prison, there's just a whole other set of obstacles. Um, so it's multi-layered. It is, that's part of the thing, they'll be tough on crime. And when you say that to me, that's being tough on uh, murderers and kidnappers and that sort of thing. But they took it to, with the drugs that people with, you know, a small amount of marijuana are put in prison for a long period, then they have a felony record and it is hard to get a job. So there's a lot of reforms on that, on that standpoint that I think we need to, need to do. Um, um, can I, there's one example of a situation that comes to mind that part of, you know, I wish that maybe I had spoken up and said something, and this may not be the best example, but it's the one that I can get to come up <laughs> in my brain right now. Um, you know, a few years ago when the GRTC started the Pulse line, mm -hmm. you know, that runs from there where the boathouse is up, out to Willow Lawn. And it's serving basically a middle-class urban sector, you know. And when they started that line, when they put it into operation, GRTC cut a route that served a low-income neighborhood. And that, you know, and that was in the paper. And it took, I don't think they ever fully restored it. Mm -hmm. But that's the, that's a kind of example that, you know, I wish maybe as a white person, I had contacted GRTC and said, hey, you know, what are you guys doing about this? Okay. You know, because to offer I think that. That's an excellent example, Kathy. That's the example that what they're fighting against. Right, because sometimes those folks don't, because some they, people see it as zero sum game. Education skills, you know, they struggle with it. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's tough. Or the energy or the confidence to speak to somebody in a higher socioeconomic bracket than yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have encountered kids all the time that are not sure they can speak to their teachers because they see their teachers as being in a different socioeconomic bracket especially in this virtual kind of setting. Mm -hmm. No, but I mean, think that's the example that comes to mind where, you know, maybe also, kudos to you. At least you were aware of the problem. I, you know, I wasn't even aware. So I didn't know that either. I read the paper and I didn't know that one. So I think they're talking about too, when you're looking and asking about the problems in their community and why they aren't doing anything about it. It's uh, you're putting a lot of energy and accusation instead of putting it in reconciliation and trying to make things uh, better when you're bringing these things up. Because obviously they are gonna need to be dealt with. And I don't think anyone's uh, saying that they aren't, but they're gonna be much, they're some of the hardest things to deal with. And I think it'll be easier when we do improve the schools in the inner city, when we do have job opportunities for people excuse me, um, then, you know, on better housing and other things that they need, that the gangs won't be as attractive, that they'll have other really um, viable options that they can, can use. Because almost anyone with enough drive can succeed. If you're willing to put the energy and drive, even in a crappy school district, you can educate yourself. Just that most people, I wouldn't have done it. I, I mean, I can tell you that right now. Uh, just either don't seem to have the ability or don't understand how to do it. Well, uh, but, but so also, I, I wonder about, you know, I, I understand, you know, going to, to school and working hard, but I, I wonder about adding to that the pressure of being afraid to get to school because your neighborhood is so dangerous to walk through. And then when you come home, you are living in a high rise apartment building that is so dangerous that once you get behind that locked door, you don't want to go out again to go to the library or do anything like that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you don't have a computer in the house. Mm -hmm. So Wi Fi. Yeah. Now that's part of the problem. When we lived uh, outside Chicago, one of their uh, ghetto high rises needed a whole lot of repair. 
and the art I can't remember numbers don't stick in my mind but it was going to be an incredible amount of money to fix this place up and I remember thinking to myself with that kind of money you could go and buy a house for every single one of those residents mm -hmm. but even the housing um the subsidized housing complexes in Richmond, there's been several articles in the paper in recent years about what poor condition those places are in. You know, some of them um, went through well over a year with no heat mm. and they were giving them space heaters. You know, the heating system had broken and it wasn't getting fixed. Another thing that we haven't talked about is social skills. I can't, and Kathy, I know you teach these. I can't, and Barbara too. I can't, and Gina too. I can't tell you the number of kids that would come to high school and didn't know how to come up to my desk, look me in the eye and say, I think you made a mistake when you graded my paper. They would not, I had to, the, one of the things I had to do the first week of school was teach them how to look me in the eye, shake my hand. Hi, my name's David. I think you made a mistake or whatever. And you can model that in the hall all day long, um, but they have no, so, so many, many kids, just no social skills, have no clue how to appropriately advocate for themselves. John and Reese are currently biting each other and hitting each other in the head with toys, but we are working on use your words. We don't hit, we don't bite, we don't throw toys. And good Lord, if I make it to June 18th, Oh, but I mean, we're, we're right, but, in, but getting yeah. to those, those minority kids coming up to you, they would most of the time approach a black teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there are kids in school coming to school with no self advocacy. They have no idea how to do it. Well, they, they can advocate with somebody that looks like them oftentimes. Now, I, some of them won't do it at all because nobody's right. ever right. stood up for them. Right. Right. I agree, but I can't give it a blanket statement saying that it's, you know, when I know from repeated experiences, they'll go and tell somebody that looks like them. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, when I was at Manchester, I had to teach a lot more kids how to self-advocate than at Midlow High. At Midlow High, Asian and Black kids knew how to look you in the eye, shake your hand, introduce themselves, and ask for what they wanted. And more of them were middle-class families. Mm -hmm. They were taught skills. Well, all of you know Dawn and John Barnes. They adopted Kaya from South Africa. And many of you may know Jason Lewis. I co-directed camp with him 20 years ago. Both families adopted a black boy. And I've had conversations with Dawn and John and with Jason Lewis. He lives in Virginia Beach. They have to parent their black son differently than they parent their white daughter. They each have a white daughter and a black son. They have to um, parent them differently. They have to tell their black sons things they never have to tell their daughter about how to behave in public. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the and hardest. Just, yeah. Go one ahead. of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. It was hard for me anyway. Was after. Um, Satina and the boys got here and that and she talks about the summer of 2016 and um and to talk with here they had come to the United States thinking they were gonna you know with the expectation they would be safe from police officers because they'd had such terrible experiences right before they left um, Kenya Ahmed got detained by the police and Satina had to go down the like two nights before they left and Satina had to go to the police station and pay a hundred dollar bribe to get him out so that he can leave with them to come to the United States. And so talking with them about if you ever get pulled by the police, these are things you need to do. To, you know, I don't, the chances of that happening here in this community, I think in general are less than in other communities, but you still need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that is true. But you know, the police ride through their apartment complex a lot more than they do others because that apartment complex has drug dealers in it. Right, right. So. 
Any other comments on chapter 11? I think we can probably get through 12 and 13 fairly quickly, unless anyone has anything else they wanted to say. Uh, chapter 12 is about lamenting. That was her first step, that we need to lament with about the way things are and things that have gone on in the past. And she lists uh, several shootings that happened. And I think, I don't know if this book or a different book that I was reading was saying that how when a, uh, a black man is killed by a white police officer, people immediately start looking into the black man's life to see, you know, what, what they can find against him, what trouble, you know, whether, but I look at it this way, whatever he did, did he deserve the death penalty? Who, the police officer that shot him or? No, the, the black man who was killed. Oh. He in effect got the death penalty. Right. For whatever the policeman or then we're stopping him for, which probably that maybe theft, maybe drugs, maybe nothing, just checking out just to see if he might have something like that. Um, so when they get to basically just giving them the death penalty. So I think even if these people are flawed who've been shot, we're all flawed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I don't think, excuse uh, what has happened to them. And she talks about if you don't know how to lament, to use the Psalms, because there's lots of lamentations and lament Psalms in there, and to write your own Psalm or own thing of lament to talk about that. Any other comments on, hmm. on 12? Well, King David sent Uriah to the front line to be murdered so he could have Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we adore King David. So David is one of the most David not, is not one of the most not, not but, you know, but you know he's I mean Jewish people revere David. He's a great king, a great warrior. David is one of the most popular boy names. Um, but look what David did. He sent Uriah to the front line where he was sufficiently quickly murdered so he could have Bathsheba. And God punished him by killing the first baby so fast, he didn't even get a name. Bathsheba's first baby never even got a name. God said, I'm going to punish you for that. Anyway, that's it, a little bit away from, from race. But uh, although Uriah was a Hittite, he was not Jewish. So that I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But anyway. I, I guess there's, a, a there's, couple of there's just so many stories in the Bible, though, that we can relate to. Oh yeah. Um, on page 134, up near the, towards the uh, last sentence or so in the uh, first paragraph there at the top says, lament is the scriptural response to pain, our pain and the pain of others. When things are not as they should be, when there is injustice, it is right to tell God in prayer. It is right to cry out to God for peace, equality, and justice. And then on to the next page on 135, in the first beginning of the first whole paragraph there. Lament changes our relationship with one another and with God. Lament, whether it is a response to our pain or to the pain of those with whom we are in relationship, creates a cycle of empathy. As we grow in relationship with those who are different from us, we begin to love them more deeply. As we love more deeply, their pain becomes our pain. When their pain becomes our pain, we must lament. We must cry out to God on their behalf. The cycle of empathy comes full circle because as we lament, our love for our friend grows even deeper. This time is enriched by divine power. Lament is an expression of pain to be sure, but is also, and I thought this was interesting, it's also a request for God to break in and set things right. Mm, I like that. So, um, I liked it when she mentioned that Jesus lamented on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. that, that always makes me so sad when he says that in the Bible. I like the way they bring in uh, the Bible throughout this book and mm -hmm. Jesus as an example of things they want us to do are things that Jesus did 
and and I like that because a lot of it um, I wouldn't have thought about it exactly that way. I never thought of what Jesus said on the cross as a lament until I read this. I kind of did because he says, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" So that kind of to me seems like a lament. Although there is questions about whether um, that is a good translation of it. I like um, it because it lets us know Jesus was fully human. Yes. Um, and our last chapter 13 is just saying that we need to go back to the fundamentals of Christianity. And what are those fundamentals? Well, basically, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the basic tenets of Christianity. So if you are trying to treat your neighbor as yourself, then you are not going to be happy if they're in situations where they are not being treated, being treated right. Do um, you think talking about race is too divisive? Some people think we just shouldn't talk about it because it'll go away if we don't talk about it. That worked out. I, I think that we need to, it's so overwhelming when you read this and you think, okay, I can lament, but how can I, you know, with so much injustice, how can I even begin to make a difference? But then if you break it down to thinking, you know what, if I am in a situation where I see something where I should speak up, I need to speak up. That's a lot more manageable. Mm hmm Yeah, we're not going to be able to go out tomorrow and solve all these problems. Even if we go out and become major we, activists. Right, no, we're, we can't solve these problems tomorrow, but hopefully we can improve it even in what's left of our lifetimes. Yes. You know, and when we can tune our ear to hear those issues, to be more sensitive and open to hearing these issues. Yes. I think that's one of the things this book has really helped me on because I really don't think I ever tuned into any, any of that. I just, uh, I wanted everyone to be treated equal. I wanted everyone, like I said, to have white privilege, uh, even though they weren't calling it white privilege then. Uh, but I didn't really think about what they were going through and why, why those things were still the way, you know, still the way they are. There was a lot of, you know, blaming it on choices that they had made you know they didn't make good choices so this is the situation they're in and uh, and some of that does have things to do with it sometimes you do make poor choices but all of us have made poor choices and not all of us have suffered greatly for some of our uh, poor choices i did have a couple of paragraphs in ch this chapter Let's see, page 139, where he is quoting uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He says, Christ walks on earth as your neighbor as long as there are people. Because hmm. if you think about when he talked about when he's separating like the sheep from the goats and they asked him, you know, and he said, well, you, when I was hungry, you fed me. You know, when I was naked, you gave me clothes. And they said, we never saw you. But when you did it for these others, you did it for me. And so when you're doing it for other people, you're doing it for Christ. And uh, the other one I liked was on page 140, about the middle of the page there. It says, Christ entered a world that did not reflect God's intentions, a world full of sinful people who created sinful systems where power, wealth, lust, and violence reigned supreme. So that isn't new. Right. Uh, but Jesus coming ushered in a radically new way of ordering all aspects of society. This is what Jesus meant when he proclaimed that the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus called people to turn away from their own ways of living and ordering society and to choose instead to believe this good news. In the new world order that Jesus preached, in the kingdom of God, the last would be first, the meek would inherit the earth, weakness was strength, and wealth afforded no privilege. We definitely haven't reached that yet. Mm -mm. 
Jesus then, preached sermons and told parables about the new kingdom that belonged to God, not to Caesar. So we live in an unjust world, uh, but the world has always been unjust. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to make it just. Just because it's always been unjust doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it just. I feel like we were making steady progress and I really feel like things are on the down, are not as good since last year, since um, the officer killed George Floyd. I think things have been a mess since then. I almost feel like we're losing ground. Everybody's so angry and protesting and marching and violence and looting and but, but maybe that's the first maybe that's the first step to making change to bringing change about to really realize well, people like me who didn't really realize how bad it is and why the system is the way it is when when you've got a wound that gets infected and gets closed over you've got to open it and get the corruption out before it'll heal and, and i understand that and if these people were angry and they were vandalizing white homes homes and white businesses, I would get it, but they're looting the places where they live and destroying their own black businesses. They're not helping. But not, but not all of them are, Kitten. What do you mean? It's, it was not all demonstrators that were doing that. It was a small percentage. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, yeah. We have to be careful that it's not, um, you know, because I've heard a number of people condemn all of the demonstrations because of what that small number did. Well, that's probably true all the time. It's usually a small group of people that work everybody right. into a frenzy. And, the, and those, those instances are what will be reported. You won't hear about the peaceful protests because that doesn't get anybody's blood pressure up and mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. sell. Right, but I the always have thought it interesting though, when there, I, this is thinking back to the race riots in the 1960s. Um, which I think are all of us old enough to remember that I not me not you. Okay. <laughs> um, I always did thought it was interesting because it was always just barely kitten just barely <laughs> that they were mad at white people. I mean, they were mad at white people, but they destroyed their own part of town. They destroyed their own businesses, and I never. I was happy they didn't come into the white section of town. <laughs> And, and burn it down but I never quite understood why they thought destroying what was around them was going to you know going to help but it probably even back then was actually just a small segment of the people who were who were out that were doing it but but I wonder if this time it was a little bit different and that some of the acts were not generated or focused on their own, you know, black neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, look at how, what was done to the monuments on Monument Avenue. Um, and so the actions were more focused on that, on the symbols of what was painful on those painful symbols. Um, and the police station in downtown Richmond, you know, um, so it, at least here in Richmond, it, it felt, it felt different than some other demonstrations and riots and in, in the past. To me, it felt. Well, different. I didn't think the demonstrations and the things bringing down, uh, statues, I really didn't think of that as being riots, quite frankly. I just thought they, this was an opportunity to get rid of them because if you think about it, the Confederates are really the only people who lost a war that have statues <laughs> put up for them. Or that could be considered traitors and had statues put and up. Still had, yeah, had statues and that put up. Yeah. And, um, and that so, um, but this is a new realization on my part. Cause like I said, I went to Robert E. Lee High School and uh, we were the rebels and Dixie was our fight song and the Confederate flag went up and down the football field all the time. So, and I saw nothing, nothing wrong with that. So, but I have come to think that there's things we can do. I think we have the right, if we would want to fly the Confederate flag, I think as an American, we have a, that right. 
but I don't think we should do everything that we have the right to do. There's just things that even though you have the right to do it, you should not do it. Mm -hmm. So Chesterfield County says you can have a Confederate flag logo, but it can't be in your face provocative. So you can have a belt buckle, but you can't have a jacket. You can't have a hat. It can be small and discreet, but it can't be in your face provocative. Is that so I'd be happy when we just don't have that anymore, when that's just something in a museum. Mm -hmm. You know, from a well, past. We had boys at Midlothian that after school would put the Confederate flag pole in the back of the truck and ride around the parking lot doing it. But, you know. Some people do stuff just because they're told they can't. True. And to be provocative, just to be sure. sure. Whatever. But um, but I'll be happy when that's just nothing. Mm -hmm. You just don't see that. And you don't see the Nazi symbols anymore. Right. People. I think for the vast majority of people, aren't we already there? Yes, I think Nazi so. It'll be nice though when everybody is there. So because we didn't go like Germany where it's actually illegal to have Nazi symbols and Nazi flags. You can be in prison for that. So uh, we have freedom of speech so we can have them, but we just shouldn't. That's just all I have to, how I feel about it. Well, we have caught up now so that if we do three chapters <laughs> next time, we will finish the book in our allotted six lessons. So uh, read the next three. Does anyone have any other comments or things that came up that they thought about as they were reading uh, 10 through 13 that they wanted to comment on or talk about? Sometimes I think I talk too much that I... <laughs> not no, you did a great job, Jamie. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. I appreciate hearing that because sometimes I feel like I not letting everyone else have their say. So we have some... We have some who've tuned in but didn't comment i'd like to hear them comment deals and gene and chris we'd like to hear what you guys think i tend to learn a lot more listening to other people <laughs> well i do too chris i just have a hard time doing it <laughs> <laughs> i'm actually like chris if i'm not assigned to teach something it's uneven. I do find that I, I like to listen to hear what other people yeah. say, and other people's uh, view of things uh, and things like that. Still water runs deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like to think that. <laughs> and, uh, I know this book and I know this meeting is talking about racial prejudice. Uh, racial prejudice anyway the, the word i think what, what is it uh right. i guess i i kind of lost my own thinking here but uh it seems like prejudice is the word we really need to be looking at because i've listened to a lot of things here that were said and i can see myself in many situations in uh among even friends with political differences, uh, my appearance difference, whatever. I could be out in Appalachia or I could be in New York City and I can be in different crowds and feel some of the same kinds of things, maybe not even for myself, but acknowledge that they very much exist for uh, many people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't want to get us off topic in a sense that you know this is dealing with uh, black issues and and trying to come to grips with making life better but i think it's a whole lot deeper and a whole lot broader than than this well she does mention that it's not just blacks you know it's native americans and there's a lot of other groups that also well and we, if we think about what's going on now with the asian community Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I think that what what we need to decide as a country, uh, even even not even talking about us as Christians, but us as Christians and in the United States, what does the United States stand for? 
you know, and that we should have equal rights for all of our citizens, just like we are all children of God. Yes. And that if we see something out there that in any way takes those rights away from other people, the rights that we would want, then we need to fight. We had to fight to get the vote for women. <laughs> you know, we have to fight to stop uh, young children from being trafficked for sex. We need to find anything like that. We've got one, one member, uh, one friend who is uh, very, um, very active in social justice. And, you know, you, you can't believe all of the things that are out there to fight for now mm. in every aspect. I mean, we have a poison, you know, and, and whether you call that Satan or whatever you call it, it's evil and greed among human beings. And so I think that until we start fighting to have at least the rules that are on the books apply and give justice to everyone, then we're still struggling to become the America that I could see would really be the place where I'm proud of. But don't you think there have always been people along the way, Susan, that have been trying? Well, yes, but we have to, we've always had to struggle and yeah. fight for it. You know, there's, there, nothing's going to come easy when it comes to justice, <laughs> you know, and, and I think Jesus is, is, you know, letting us know that we have to pick up our cross and bear it and, you know, and to bring that kind of justice, you know, to, to every, to all of our sisters and brothers. And so, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's really hard thing to do. Um, but, you know, it just makes you so sad to see and when you hear the things that you hear about uh, happening and the thing and the rules and regulations that are on the books that we put there for some selfish reason by some, you know, rich group of people who wanted to get their way all the time. And so, you know, it's, I don't, you know, no one has the answer other than being, we can all, only start with just, you know, um, being as um, loving as we can to the people we meet every day and trying to find where those injustices are and let our voice be heard you know, that we don't agree with that. And I think it's just like in our church, you know, we, we, don't, we don't know that someone's having a struggle until Cindy or someone in the congregation tells us, and then we rally and we help people. That's the thing we need for social justice. We need someone to tell us, you know, what's happening and then we rally, you know, it's, it's when you don't know something, when you don't talk about racism, when you don't talk about mental illness, mm -hmm. that, 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 it, that it just festers and the, the bad can keep just building up. Like Claire was saying, you know, it festers until you break it open, you know, and sometimes breaking it open is turning the tables over in, in the temple. I think you're trying to summarize the book. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, because that's what, to become aware, and now that you're aware, to love others, and, and we're to try really, to make things better. And we're really good as a congregation, and we are a white congregation, primarily, other than the people that we've brought in, you know, with Kathy's help and the church's help to, you know, to, uh, the refugee resettlements and things like that. So it's really hard for us to become aware as a church of those social issues, you know, um, in, in except what we hear in the news. So I think that, you know, people like Kathy and other people in the church that are really tuned into those things and are working with people. Bernie works with kids all of the time. Mm -hmm. And to have that kind of awareness of what the needs are. And, and I know Barbara works with uh, tutoring children and working with kids and to find out what those needs are and what we might be able to help with even if it's just voting the right way or giving us the idea of here's what this person thinks and here's what this person thinks and we vote how we think our conscience should vote. So. 
Amen. <laughs> Any other comments or anything? Then I'll see y'all next Wednesday for chapters, what would it be, 14, 15, and 16?